All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Cabinet Health. Thanks for joining. For people who don't know, what's the company do? Thanks for having me, first of all. Um, of course. I'm Achal, co-founder, CEO at Cabinet Health, and our mission is to eliminate single-use plastic in healthcare, starting with everyday medicines. So we make, we move, we sell over-the-counter prescriptions and medical consumables that are your everyday products, like this allergy relief right in front of me. Yep. Um, in Zyrtec. A sustainable, Zyrtec. Okay. Yeah, the equivalent of Zyrtec in a sustainable, refillable system instead of in plastic bottles. So I get, I get the point of the sustainability part. Why this industry? So if sustainability is the model, what yeah. made you want to go specifically into the focus on this industry in this way? Absolutely. So I'm a third generation healthcare entrepreneur. Okay. So when most kids were spending their summers at camp, uh, I grew up actually spending mine in a medicine factory that my grandfather built from the ground up. Okay. So my entry so where point. They, they create pharmaceuticals of all e kinds? Exactly. They create okay. acetaminophen. So okay. the active ingredient in Tylenol and, and other products like that. And so at a really young age, learned the ins and outs of the world of medicine and manufacturing. And really what that set off in, in my family, my legacy is I have aunts and uncles in the medicine space. My parents are recently retired physicians in Virginia. Wow. My brother works at a big healthcare company. And so to your question of why healthcare, why medicine, um, it's really the world that I grew up in, uh, seeing it from manufacturing all the way through to how do people just get care in a doctor's office yeah. on a one-to-one -one basis. So when you were a kid growing up and you're in, let's say your grandparents' facilities, what are you seeing? At what mm -hmm. point did you think, let's make this a business? At what point did you think, let's continue the family business, let's continue the legacy, but do it different? What were the things that you were seeing either from a perspective of, I'd love to fix this, sure. or from a perspective of, there's an opportunity here? What did you see changing in the marketplace that maybe your grandparents or your parents didn't see? Oh, well, candidly, it was never a light bulb moment, okay. right? Like, And I think that's been the case of our business and, and many businesses. It's, it's an evolution over time. And what I would share is that the way that I grew up was with a set of principles. And those principles were focused on in healthcare, anything you build should focus on quality, affordability, and environmental sustainability. That third pillar was particularly progressive at the time, and frankly, still is in healthcare. But the broader reason for that principle is that the planet that we live on and the air that we breathe is inextricably linked to our physical health. And so if you're a healthcare company, you should care about your impact on the environment. Okay, so you thought, God, it, pharmaceuticals are here to stay. We know how to do it. There's this element of sustainability that's lacking. Exactly. That's an interesting way of thinking about it. But so then you, I assume you dug into the sustainability part being like, wow, there's so many of these here we that's, have in front of right. us that are, that are going to waste. And yeah. why do you think people miss that? And when I say people, I don't mean the consumer. I mean the businesses out there. Why do you mm -hmm. think they miss the, the fact that these get thrown away at a rapid rate? I'm sure yeah. you know the numbers, but why, why do you think that was missed? Well, first I'll kind of share the scale of the problem and then yeah. go into why the industry hasn't really changed. So every single year, the pharmaceutical, the medicine industry produces 190 billion plastic bottles, like the ones that are right in front of me. 190 um, billion of these. 190 billion. And for people listening, this is basically just your over-the-counter little medicine pill. Exactly. Your over-the-counter medicine, your amber prescription bottles. And of those 190 billion bottles, less than 5% get recycled. Most of them end up in our landfills, our oceans, incinerated into the air that we breathe. And that's a massive environmental challenge. But what fundamentally makes that a healthcare problem is that we ingest upwards of a credit card of microplastics mm -hmm. every single week. Mm -hmm. um, those are we showing as an average American. Average we as an average American. Yeah. And those microplastics are ending up in our bloodstream, our lung tissue, the breast milk of mothers. Mm -hmm. uh, a few weeks ago, a study came out showing the correlation between microplastics in our heart artery and a four and a half X increased risk of cardiac events like stroke, heart attack, and even death. And so fundamentally plastic waste is a healthcare issue. And the challenge of addressing that is that the healthcare industry has a number of entrenched innovation challenges. And so your question is, you know, why, why has the industry almost not paid attention to this? Yeah, why has it been neglected? And neglected it. And the reality is, is that healthcare is really complex and packaging and product innovation in the industry has lagged other industries. The regulatory environment's really complex from a federal and state level. All the supply chains are built for plastic mm -hmm. uh, and throughput. But I think actually most importantly, there isn't a market leader in sustainability in healthcare. Okay. So there are a handful of companies that move most of the medicine in the US any given day. And there haven't been executives that have gotten fired for using plastic in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so the courage to act, the willingness to act is a massive missing component. Yeah. And part of what our focus at Cabinet is, is that we know that alone, we can only address a small fraction of those 190 billion plastic bottles every year. 
But what we can do is we can lead, we can inspire the industry to move faster, whether it's through showing that you can use sustainability as a mechanism of innovation to drive new market share and new opportunities, or to capture the hearts and minds of consumers who want things that are not plastic in their homes, as long as you're not compromising on costs, quality, effectiveness. And from your perspective, has has anyone woken up to this? Like any of your any of the large pharmaceutical players? Absolutely. I think in the last few years in particular, there's been a pretty meaningful shift in uh, a desire from large companies to address this issue. We started the business in 2018. And honestly, when we started, where we had the most energy um, and what still drives us today is like the end consumer. There are people that are buying sustainable products in other parts of their homes that want to transition their medicine cabinet to be more sustainable as well. But I think what has really been exciting for us as we've built this sustainable healthcare company is that the market is starting to move from a macro perspective as well, where some of the biggest drug stores in the U.S., pharmaceutical distributors, they're setting goals by 2030, we're going to reduce half of the single-use plastic in our store brands, or by 2040, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And I think the challenge is is they've set these goals and are frankly having a little bit of trouble with understanding how they're going to achieve them now. So if I'm you, and I'm going to go back to like a whiteboarding session. I'm thinking of starting this company. Yeah. I, here I have my grandparents' company. Uh, maybe I got a chip on my shoulder. I'm a young guy. I'm thinking, let me go do this myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, clearly, you've seen the vertical in terms of sustainability that's missing in the space. Sure. You could have just went full sustainability, right? And and then in, you could have, right? Did you think about that? Like just being like, let me let me approach these companies yeah. and sell them something that's more sustainable packaging that can replace this hundred ninety billion dollar or not dollar but pound problem. Sure. And I think what I'll share is a little bit of uh, professional background that led us to building cabinet. So that'll help inform kind of our perspective on why we didn't just go the sustainable packaging route. Mm-hmm. My co-founder Russ and I met over a decade ago, and our first jobs. We're actually working at a big management consulting firm, and we're building out the first sustainability practice within that firm. And we ended up- For all your clients? For all um, the clients or for specific? For a specific subset of clients. And the way that we- In the healthcare space? uh, Healthcare was definitely one of the verticals. And one of the ways that we approached that was we went and studied how startups, social enterprises around the world were using mission to outcompete launching new products and services. This is the magic. Recruiting and retaining talent, creating new markets altogether, and had a ton of fun going and spending time with founders who were really just punching above their weight with mission at the core. The other side of that was that we also translated those into case studies for our Fortune 500 clients. And so the juxtaposition of small, scrappy, mission-driven startup and then massive Fortune 500 companies was a an incredible learning experience. Yeah. We saw how difficult change management is within large companies. What year was this, by the um, way? This was in 2013 to 2018. Okay. And really, I share that because some of the things that we learned is that if you look at all the massive industries around healthcare, healthcare is a trillion plus dollar industry. They started to make meaningful strides when it comes to sustainability, but healthcare hadn't moved an inch. And when you start to peel back the layers of, of the why behind that, going back to some of the macro shifts that I shared, it's not a willingness to adopt sustainable solutions. There are structural challenges to doing that. And so if we had created the most sustainable packaging in pharmaceuticals and went to a procurement team uh, and, and tried to sell that in or hand it off, that would have been a bit dead on arrival, frankly, because then they'll be like, all right, I don't know what to do with this compostable pouch or this compostable pouch is X percent more than the plastic alternative and I have a mandate to maintain this margin. And so for us, we've built a consumer brand because we knew those challenges existed. And so rather than going in through procurement team, we built our own brand. We sold direct to consumer, we sold online, we sell on Target and CVS now. And that has allowed us to build scale, to build a captive consumer audience, to improve the unit economics of our solutions that now allows us to sell into enterprises as a full stack sustainable solution. I love that. So you saw it early and you had enough examples of proof. And so what was your first step? What was your first product that you came to market with? So we launched a portfolio of sustainable, refillable products, really your everyday OTC products on e-commerce. So like really the first chapter of Cabinet was starting uh, as an Amazon business okay. where we, we- Literally as an Amazon business? We started just selling our products on Amazon. Okay. And the reason for that was low friction to get to consumers. There are people already searching for things like Cetirazine, which is in front of me. What uh, year was that, by the way? This was also in 2018. Okay. 2018, you launched mm-hmm. on Amazon, got it, okay. And so we started to, to build a portfolio of everyday over-the-counter medicines for allergy, cold and flu, pain relief, digestive health, 
boring run-of-the-mill products. And you're making the products at your grandparents' facility? That supply chain is part of the broader yeah. broader supply chain. Um, it's a few steps upstream, but um, we have a portfolio of medicines that have different active ingredients. And so through that kind of family supply chain, I've also built relationships up and down the, the medicine supply chain over the years. And so what's really been a fun part of this journey for us is that often when folks think of medicine and pharmaceuticals, it's this like sterile white kind of hallway and like image of labs. And for us, it's actually family. And so, or, or people that are effectively one degree of separation away from family. And so when, when you first launched on Amazon, what was the price point you guys were ha like had to go after? Were you competing on price? We were uh, a more premium offering at that time. Of course, yeah. And uh, then and you had data to suggest that's okay. I imagine we, from we the did, case and, and we were able to build some traction yeah. at that price point. And for us, it's... So it's about telling the story. Exactly. Yeah. It's like you're already buying a digestive health product, have a sustainable switch that looks nicer, it's sustainable, it's bachelor quality tested, and it's yeah. a few dollars more. And then how did it go? You launch on Amazon, what are you seeing? Yeah, so a lot of learnings from that. I think the first is that consumers are willing to buy sustainable alternative to their everyday medicines when given the choice. And I think... The reason we launched on Amazon is that that was our first hypothesis that we wanted to test. It's like, will people in an industry... Do people that, care enough? Yeah. And it's an industry that's dominated by brands that our parents and our grandparents have been using for generations. And so when you're talking about these brands that one single ingredient is a billion dollar brand, mm -hmm. the first question is, can you actually compete against them and capture consumer like wallet share effectively? And the answer to that was yes. And did you guys raise capital prior to this or are you guys bootstrapping it? Did you need to raise capital at this time? You know, the beauty of launching on Amazon is super right. low friction, very little upfront cost, just take some time, a bunch of online YouTube classes on how to build an Amazon business. And, yep, yep. and so at this at that point, we had not raised any outside capital. We really launched the business, placed a PO with a vendor and uh, we're off to the races. And then what was your next step? Like at what point did you realize this is a real business, this isn't a side hustle anymore. We have the yeah. data, the proof point, the case studies were right, let's say. Mm -hmm. And at what point are you thinking, let's go scale this? I think there are two signs of that for us. The first is that we didn't spend a dollar on marketing for the first six months of launching the brand. Okay. And it was growing organically month over month at a rapid clip. When you say rapid, do you know the percentage? Just curious. Uh, we went from zero to about 100,000 in monthly revenue in those six months. Okay. With Healthy. no marketing spend. Yeah. And so... At the time, I didn't know if that was fast or not, but talked to some other folks that were building businesses and they're like, there's enough here that like people want this product. You're not spending money on marketing. It's clearly working. And so then that was sign one for us. The second from a quantitative perspective was that we started then layering in online marketing to that and it just added fuel to the fire. It was quite efficient. Like social media or like ads? Like what, what, what kind of online mm -hmm. marketing are you doing? At this point, we were still on Amazon. So Amazon, pay-per-click advertising, really efficient, high intent keywords, people who search cetirazine don't do that for fun. Uh, so <laughs> That's the, true. The, it's a very specific the search. conversions were there. And so I think that was like the second signal. And I think I share those as like two quantitative proof points, but all the while the most energy came from the, from the customers that were adopting the product early on and writing in being like, I've been using plastic medicine my entire life. I have X, Y, and Z other products that I want you to switch over as well. This is when we first started getting... So they're giving you the feedback on what other products they want you guys to come to market with. Exactly okay. right. And so we had okay. started with a small portfolio. I think it was seven products maybe at the time. And we had folks asking us for other things that were in their medicine cabinet, whether it was over the counters, prescriptions or, or vitamins. Like it was really the full lot of, I get these things in a plastic packaging format. I've been looking for something more sustainable. And totally. Can you help me? And so did you do that? Then you, you get more SKUs going? We really started to expand SKU count at that time, which um, there are a lot of lessons in that in that journey as well. So I think the first way that we thought about it was how do we get beyond just being on Amazon and how do we think about expanding the product portfolio as well? Yeah, so that's a hard one. So right now you're kind of sort of mm -hmm. D to C, mm -hmm. which is great to yeah. some extent. Entering retail is a whole other game. Absolutely. And so how did you decide on what to focus on at that time? Sure. So I think our sequence over the years was start with Amazon, launch on our own D to C site, from there, cabinethealth.com, and then start to, to launch in other online marketplaces that were more sustainability focused, the likes of Grove Collaborative. And that's where we started to build the brand. It's where we started to build a captive consumer base that cares about sustainability, that wanted easy alternatives that were uh, to their plastic over the counter medicines. And from there, we started to build out in two ways. First was portfolio, second was distribution. So 
we started to expand the product portfolio to a broader suite of over-the-counter medicines, really in response to what our customers were asking for. And then we also started to have initial conversations with larger brick and mortar retailers, knowing that over 85% of medicine purchases in the US still happen in physical stores. In Interesting. And did you raise capital at that moment? Or were you guys still bootstrapping? Mm -hmm. So this would have been around 2020. And we had started to see good traction in an online environment. We knew that we wanted to expand at that moment into additional OTC products over time into prescriptions and online setting and then into brick and mortar retail. And so we raised capital to continue to just progressing through milestones. We had never raised capital at this point. I was going to say, two management <laughs> consultants doing case studies, raising capital is a whole, you're a fish out of water. Yeah, absolutely. What was that like? Well, it's funny because... For us, we were just looking at the P&L of the business and it was like, we're making money, so why do we need to raise capital? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. It's a fundamentally mm-hmm. sound question. It is a little backwards, but for, for, I guess, velocity, it helps. What did you find successful? What was the hard parts, mm-hmm. the humbling moments of raising capital, the things you learned the most? Sure. I mean, I think there, there are a lot of lessons in just because you think something's a good idea, it doesn't make it investable. Sure. So we were fortunate in that we had a number of mentors and like close friends and family that had gone through either raising capital for their own business or had been investors in a more formal setting. And we got a lot of mentorship and guidance along the way. And and I think for us, it was really about just staying true to our mission. Like ultimately that helped. In your deck, so to go back to the case study that you had, so as you're meeting investors, is there is there someone you're pointing to being like, this is an example of a company, these two, mm-hmm. three are examples of companies that are now at 500 million or more have yeah. been acquired that we're sort of chasing the path of? Sure. Candidly, no. Okay. And I think that was one of the challenges they were on their way. of like where, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think yeah. the way that we view our business is like we've built a sustainable healthcare capability. And I share that word really specifically because for us, we have a supply chain that can package things that are sustainable at scale efficiently. We have proprietary packaging that's refillable, compostable, it has all the FDA approvals to bring to market. We have a brand that can lead and inspire the industry and we know the regulation and, and like the quality requirements in this space really well. Mm-hmm. But that's a complex story to tell, especially at an early stage as a company where you're not saying, hey, give me $3 million, I'm gonna put it into adding 2,000 retail doors and then I'm going to come back two years from now and have this revenue. Yeah. At what point did you guys think about getting on Shark Tank or or were approached about Shark Tank? You know, I think we started to get emails inbound from them a few years ago. Uh, So probably around that time, honestly, 2020, 2021. And for us, we were candidly just really busy building the business, especially during COVID. Um, The need for the sorts of medicines that we sell in an online environment was skyrocketing. And so we, you know, had inbounds for a while. And then as we started to turn the corner and stabilize in a, and I call it a post-COVID environment, telling the story around the mission and building an awareness at the consumer level of the issue of plastic waste in healthcare Mm -hmm. has always been part of something that Russ and I find to be incredibly important. And so Shark Tank for us was an opportunity to be able to do that, get on national TV, share that 190 billion of these plastic bottles are produced every year and lead and inspire consumers and big businesses around what we can do about it. Yeah. And so you go on the show, you, you start to sort of educate them on the mm-hmm. problem. They seem like they're aware of it, but mm-hmm. they also quickly pick up on the fact that the FD, like you have to go through approvals for the packaging mm-hmm. to itself, which yeah. is a problem for them in the sense of like yeah. profit margin. It eats into your margin. Absolutely. Uh, what was that like just confronting that in the tank? Mark's all over you. What was that like? Well, I think the conversation was really productive. First of all, we, for know, the audience, for yeah, <laughs> not for <laughs> your blood pressure. Yeah, we're we're twenty five <laughs> feet away from from the sharks, and it's definitely a new a new setting. But yeah. what I would share is that the the questions that the sharks asked in person and were, were very thoughtful, and I think they're they're fundamental business questions that a lot of founders get, which is like, yeah. you need to invest this amount in R and D, and the return on that investment timeline is X number of years. What are your proof points to actually starting to build that return on investment? And can you do that in a setting where five people are asking you the question at the same time, 25 feet away was the experience. And then you went in, I think 500 K right for two and a half percent. I believe so. Yeah. Before going on the show, did you do any research to to suggest like what sharks do when you're in the tank? Cause they all slash it by half. Completely. Every time. Completely. Okay. And so, you know, I've been an avid Shark Tank watcher since college. So my, my research process was my normal Friday night routine. And we looked at some of the deal dynamics that have historically been on Shark Tank. But you know, more importantly for us, the goal was to find folks that can help us accelerate the mission, can accelerate okay. education around the issue of plastic waste, 
uh, and also just help us execute as we build the business. And so when you went on the show, did you have a specific shark you were trying to get or one or two? We had a plan for who we would be open to partnering with and okay. we ended up partnering with two of them. Both of them? That's Both right. of the ones that you wanted? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Why Mr. Wonderful? What did you like about him in general? Mm -hmm. So he's been an investor in other similar brands. Like there's okay. a company, Blue Land, Blue which Land. makes refillable, we had Blue Land on our sustainable podcast. Yeah. household goods. And it's, it's a perfect corollary to the behaviors that someone can do in their medicine cabinet. And then, you know, the other shark we partner with is Tony Shu, yeah. exceptional operator, like has, you know, been CEO a founder, of CEO, founder of Dorash, yeah. taken it public from zero to the market cap that it's at today. And um, I think more equally, if not more importantly, incredibly humble, thoughtful, and has a deep connection to sustainability on a personal level. Yeah. And so knew there was a lot we can learn from him as we grow the business. What was the deal you guys struck on, at least on TV? Mm -hmm. You know, actually, I don't even remember the details of, of it on TV, but I think the what I'll share with you is that the conversations afterwards really focused around how do we continue to build towards this mission, grow the business, and uh, enable Cabinet as a team to be successful. And so... Really positive experience, both I think like on the TV era segments and then sure. afterwards as well. And so the deal, did it close with both of them after or did one of them mm -hmm. drop out or how did that go? One of the two is involved in the business today. That's probably the most I can share. Okay. Hopefully the one you like, the one you the one you wanted, hopefully. I think it ended, it ended in a good spot. Yeah. <laughs> I love this diplomatic answer. Mm -hmm. But the exposure of the show, huge. And so what are you Absolutely. seeing on that side of it? So you guys air, mm -hmm. what are you seeing sales wise, either on Amazon yeah. or obviously it also helps with retail, right? Cause now they're reaching sure. out to you being like, Hey, come in my store. But prior to that, what are you guys seeing on air day around your mm -hmm. sales? So I think there are really two things that we noticed from the show. The first is going back to why we went on, on Shark Tank. Cause like we want to build awareness of this issue that we care about, give consumers an understanding that there are options that are sustainable out there and inspire large companies to do something about it as well. And so the first thing that we noticed is the consumer excitement and sentiment around the brand just continued to build. And I think from the moment we had that Shark Tank airing till today, it's been a nice steady uptick of awareness around the issue, our, cons our customer base continuing to, to buy from us and new customers coming in. And so we had a pretty large sales spike on the day of like the actual airing. I'd have to go back and see what the exact number is, but sure. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't like a 30x bump over like a normal day on our online channels. And then the second thing that uh, I didn't expect, honestly, was the level of engagement from uh, our enterprise customers and pipeline customers, where the number of messages we had from folks that are in large pharmaceutical companies or retailers being like, I watch Shark Tank every Friday night with my kids. And they were really excited about what you're building. And we think that we need to accelerate what we're already doing, or we think that we need to bring this to our organization. And that I think has remained true. And the reason why it matters is because I think when these issues gain national level exposure, then the willingness to act and the courage to act is easier yeah. because you can say, Hey, there are companies that are already doing this. They've already told tens of millions of Americans that there are sustainable healthcare solutions that are out there. And so either we can catch up and deliver this ourselves um, and capture that market opportunity or we'll be left in the dust. When you guys went on Shark Tank, how much, like, where were you at from a funding perspective? Were you past an A round or where were you guys at? Yeah, so we had uh, closed a seed round at that point. And okay. so in 2021, we raised like a pretty good timing. seed round and then uh, yeah. we closed effectively an A shortly after Shark Tank. Good timing. And then what did you see in the marketplace in terms of different SKUs or, you know, just product offerings mm -hmm. that you're bringing to people? You know, the big thing that we've learned from a SKU perspective is the first time founder lesson of like over proliferation was very real where, okay. you know, we, you we looked at much. the world of OTC, we added a good number of SKUs, frankly, like where at one point we were up to north of 23, 24 medicines. Wow. And what we started to see though, was that the concentration of sales velocity was really in like the top 10 movers. And so... What we've done since then is we've really- And that's medicine, not so much supplements. Exactly, okay. over-the-counter medicines. And so we really simplified and amplified those core SKUs in our portfolio now. But I think what we've also learned is that we view the full medicine cabinet of our customers and our patients as what we want to service. And the most commonly requested product from our customers, 80 plus percent of them take at least one prescription. Uh, and so the natural cross sell from having an over the counter medicine product to prescriptions was very sensible for us. And so the next thing we launched was a, a sustainable pharmacy uh, last year. What does that mean? 
So we today service over 200 medicines uh, in a sustainable refillable system. You can transfer your prescription to Cabinet Health RX, and instead of getting it in these amber bottles that break down into microplastics, you get it in a compostable pouch that's made of wood cellulose. And when it comes to global expansion, do you ever think about that? Maybe moving to Canada, what is that like? Are you already there maybe? So the macro way we think about where we sell the product is like, uh, where's the issue of plastic, right? So where's the issue of plastic in healthcare? And it's a global issue. Yeah. And so the short answer to that is we always think about global expansion from the perspective of where can we maximize the impact and mission, but doing it in a way that's sequential and, and thoughtful. So the U.S. healthcare and specifically medicine and pharmaceutical market is massive, as I'm sure most sure. listeners are aware of. Yeah. And so for us, it's been a good beachhead to navigate a complex regulatory environment. If we can win in a market where sustainability is probably 10 years behind Europe and other other regions, then we feel confident in our ability to win in, in those regions as well. And so, you know, the natural extension points for us that we're thinking through right now are Europe is a, is a great market opportunity for us due to some of the sustainability tailwinds, the regulatory uh, environment that's becoming more favorable for non-plastic alternatives. Canada is the same way. There are provinces where plastic is taxed, even if it's medicine plastic. Um, and so there starts to become a real economic incentive to shift behavior. And then I think really exciting for us too is like going fully upstream. Um, I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. Most prescriptions today that you get at your local pharmacy, they're packaged into plastic bottles that are anywhere from 30 to 1,000 pills. Typically in India or, or China, they're then shipped across the world to your local pharmacy where they're poured from that plastic bottle into another plastic bottle. And so wow. today, the way the supply chain works is we're putting things into plastic, shipping air halfway across the world to pour it into another plastic bottle and throw it away. Mm -hmm. So as we think about the layered nature of plastic waste in healthcare, that's really where our team gets energized is how do we go straight to that source mm -hmm. so that the product never even enters a plastic bottle. And in addition to reducing plastic in two places then, both at the pharmacy level and the manufacturer level, we're reducing the weight of the product, the amount of air that's in the product, reducing the shipping cost and space that's taken up. For someone like me, right? So mm -hmm. I don't take anything over the counter. Mm -hmm. I don't take any medicine. Yeah. Rare. But I take a lot of supplements. And so what's going on in the supplement mm -hmm. space? Or is, it, is it big enough for you to attack or is it too small? The way, once again, it goes back to like our perspective on how we think about our patients and our customers' needs where... When our customers come to us, they're like, hey, I have a medicine cabinet and it's full of different things that I use to feel better. Whether that is a supplement, a OTC medicine that I might take occasionally or a prescription that I take every day to manage uh, a condition that I have. And so for us, it's really the, the opportunity to your question of like, is the market large enough? Uh, it's driven by our customer base and our patient base. And within that context, absolutely, it's, it's large okay. enough. Good to know. I hope to see that out there yeah. soon. What can people expect from you in 2024? I know mm -hmm. we can talk about a little bit yeah. this, this packaging you have here, and we have a plant. Connect the two dots for the people yeah. listening. Absolutely. So these things uh, in front of us, we have a compostable pouch. Um, that's Cabinet's proprietary medicine pouch. Uh, it's made of three different layers of wood cellulose. It is made of backyard compostable materials, and it's passed two-plus years of stability testing by medicine by pill count. That probably sounds pretty boring and specific, but it's, it's what's important. required to be able to bring <laughs> sustainable products to market in healthcare. So this pouch, while it may look simple, is a representation of years of research and development, lab testing, uh, and going through regulatory processes that actually are where the rubber meets the road when it comes to bringing sustainability to life in healthcare. Mm -hmm. This plant that you have in front of you is a plant that's actually been grown in uh, soil that's made of composted cabinet pouches. So at the end of the life of this compostable pouch turns into dirt, you can grow plants in it. So rather than having something that degrades into microplastics that's in our environment for hundreds, if not thousands of years, this packaging turns into dirt, a completely natural substance. Is this the first of its kind? This is, there is anything like this? Mm -hmm. This is the first in the world of over-the-counter and prescription medicines, yeah. That's amazing. It's a first for us. That's pretty cool. What else can you tell us about what's on deck for 2024? So we're having a, a fun start to the year. So right now, the business as a whole has started to expand into retail. So in December, we launched in, in Target. And for us, that's been a really important milestone to- Was that a nationwide launch or specific markets? Uh, across the US. Okay, um, huge. And really for us, it's been an important milestone to be able to get our products in stores where people are buying their everyday medicines. And builds mass market brand awareness. It starts to get consumers aware that there are you know, alter sustainable switches and alternatives. And so 
what's on deck for 2024 is just more of continuing to execute well in that space, uh, make sure that we're able to have products you know, doing, doing some of the simple things well, keep products in stock, make sure they're in a good spot for consumers to be able to buy. The second thing that we're focused on outside of retail is continuing to grow our online pharmacy. So as I mentioned, we have a sustainable pharmacy. Today, we have around 200 different medicines that we service. Um, by the middle of this year, we'll be up to about 500 medicines. And think of these as long-term maintenance medications that someone might use on a daily basis. Uh, and we want to build a large enough portfolio that anything that over time you take in your medicine cabinet that's prescription, you can transfer to cabinet. And then the third thing that we're really excited about this year from a, a business perspective is we've started to build and, and launch a number of enterprise partnerships. So I mentioned that there are 190 billion plastic right. bottles every single year yeah. produced by the medicine industry. Uh, our brand will play a role in reducing a subset of those bottles. But if we do not create the courage and accelerate the industry away from plastic faster, then we'll as a society, not actually meaningfully address the 190 billion bottles. And so the way that cabinet plays a role in that is that we actually have a powered by cabinet product line where we take our full stack sustainable healthcare solution. We're able to do white labeled effectively products for large pharma companies and distributors where it would be in their brand has a powered by cabinet stamp on the side. And we can show them the way of like, here's how you can win with sustainability in the market. For our business, it starts to build meaningful scale and impact potential and also reduces the cost of the packaging over time so that non-plastic alternatives from an economic business case perspective can be a viable alternative to plastics, which you know, at one point in time were the more expensive option as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I can think of like Hyper, or not Hyper, as Momentus who came on our podcast mm -hmm. about their supplements, that'd be a yeah. no-brainer. Of course, I think the, the, I guess the, the time difference is they have to probably cancel some of their contracts or at least allow them to expire on that side of it. And so we can wrap on this. And so mm -hmm. you started the company cause you saw something from a marketing consult or a management consulting perspective in mm -hmm. the space of where sustainability allows other brands to win. Okay. So here we are roughly 10 years, a little over 10 years later from you doing that study. What do you see in the space now? Like if someone, let's say you, let's say your younger self exists today, right? And they're doing the management consulting exercise on the same exact thing. What do you see as like another pillar? Um, that allows brands like yours to win? Yeah, um, I'll answer philosophically kind of how we, we think of it, and then I'll leave with like kind of one answer to your question. So uh, sustainability alone will not win. And I think that's one thing that we've learned as we've built the business is that if you want a consumer to adopt a solution, um, design is important, sustainability is important, quality and effectiveness is important, uh, and value is important as well. So while we launched our brand as a premium cost product, uh, over time, we've actually brought the price down where it sits between the store brand and the, the name brand price now. And so our price proposition has come to a better value offering over time, which was enabled by building some initial scale with the more expensive solution. And really, I share that because in order to capture more market share and to truly change the status quo to be sustainable, it can't just be a premium offering. And so I think that's kind of lesson one for us along the way is that value, quality, effectiveness, sustainability need to live in harmony together to be able to win in market. The second thing I'll share just to distill like the most important thing to bring sustainability to life is like operational effectiveness. So we, we always say like where rubber meets the road in sustainability is like your supply chain. And if you can't transition it to be as effective with sustainable solutions, you can't get the cog structure to work, you can't produce materials reliably and consistently, then especially in our space where quality is paramount, then you don't have a chance of even getting to the starting line. Yeah. So it's expensive or it can be. It, it can be. And, and I think it's where, um, like any other business, you have to understand like where do you need to invest like first? And uh, for us, it's very much been sequential. And you know, growing up in the supply chain certainly provides a, a nice boost as well. Yeah. It seems like in some way you were born to do this, <laughs> or at least you have the most intel <laughs> on it, frankly. And so yeah, almost like, right. yeah, like a legacy play, but you're the only one in the world that could probably figure this out. And it's been an incredible journey because I think the what Cabinet is, is it's a combination of three generations of manufacturing and supply chain experience, yes. But my co-founder, Russ, also has 10 years of sustainable product and development expertise. He's worked with a lot of mission-driven brands before. And so our special sauce is combining those two things where... We understand the manufacturing, we understand the supply chain really well, which in healthcare, if you don't, is is a really difficult spot to start from. 
But we also understand what it takes to inspire consumers to build sustainable physical packaging and products uh, and to build a brand that can win not only in the consumer level, but in the enterprise level. Well, look, tell everyone where they can find you. Go to Target, obviously. You yeah. probably want to get those velocities up. We're in Target uh, across the U.S. Um, you can find the specific stores on cabinethealth.com. We have a store locator. Uh, if you have a prescription that you want to transfer away from a plastic alternative, you can do that on cabinethealth.com as well. Appreciate it. Thank you for yeah. coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.